Thank you. Um, yes, so I will be starting to uh, by trying to explain the question that I want to try to answer with these uh, three lectures. And uh, this goes uh, back to Bob Harper's picture where he had uh, logic, types, and uh, categories or something like that. So there he had, uh, let's say, intuitionistic logic. Then at the level of... Ah, so what, what should we do? And, and conversely here. So I, I, I cannot write anywhere. So this this works? Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay, um, good. <laughs> oh. oh, this is bad. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, intuitionistic logic and then something like simply type lambda calculus that was the type theory counterpart for it so this, this was just uh, about proving propositions so it was about provable and these were about language of proofs um, and this was all and then categories of a certain kind okay and with Steve uh, Woody we, we will learn about probably about Cartesian closed categories and things like that so all this line was built around systems in natural deduction. So what you have seen in uh, the lectures of, uh, of uh, Frank, the first two lectures, you have been introduced to natural deduction. Okay, so this line was the black means natural deduction. Now, today we have seen sequence calculus for the first time. So so I should write here, logic in natural deduction. Okay. Now I take the same logic. And I don't insist on intuitionistic for some reasons that I will explain. So it will be actually more linear and classical logic I will be interested in uh, in the first place. So let me remove this here and speak about linear and classical logic and the question that we would like to answer here is what is a good language that maps th that matches this particular way of speaking about about proofs and that's the first question just for the sake of knowledge and then the second question is is it interesting so what is this useful for and the claim of the lectures is that it will help us. I need the blue which is not sticky. Claim this question mark is going to be a good language for the, anali for the analysis of simply type lambda calculus or of uh, uh, other languages. So it's also going to be a good intermediate language if you think in terms of implementation. So if you begin to think about the operational semantics of the language, uh, the abstract machine that will implement this language will be actually very much described at this level here. So the claim is that sequence calculus is more or less the, uh, the curry howard correspondent for sequence calculus is a formal language for abstract machines, for functional language, something like that. Okay, that's, that's the general theme. So now, how, I'm, how, I'm, how am I going to split the three lectures? Well, 
Lecture one will be very much about linear logic. So we will carry a little bit of this program in linear logic. So since linear logic has not been introduced in these lectures, this will also count as an introduction to linear logic. So lecture two, we'll try to carry the same program for classical logic. And we will then face the problem of what it means to have a constructive presentation of classical logic. So some of you may know about the extension of Curry Howard uh, made by Tim Griffin in the early 90s. Or others of you may know about Girard's work on uh, logical system, constructive classical logical system called LC. And that's very much what we are going to see tomorrow. And lecture three is um, meant to introduce you to a very powerful technique which is called realizability. So again, it will be here classical realizability. And I will show you how to prove strong normalization for the system introduced in lecture two. And out of this proof, you will get through translation the proof of strong normalization for called by name or called by value, simply type lambda calculus. And I even claim that realizability is best understood probably in this framework because you will see that this language being lower level in some sense than the simply type lambda calculus decomposes things in such a way that uh, all the ideas of realizability in some sense fall into small pieces that fit very well together. But it's m maybe it's a matter of taste. Okay, so that's roughly the plan. And you will, hear, we, you will hear more about these ideas in uh, next week in uh, uh, Amal Ahmed's, Ahmed's lecture, where she will talk a lot about logical relations, which is a binary version of what I'm going to tell you, because I, I will need only unary predicates to uh, speak about normalization. But uh, you can use the same ideas for programs related to these programs. And uh, so realizability is more or less synonymous to uh, logical relations. And there are other synonymous, so also often referred to as a computability technique. There are many words for the same thing. And, and someone in the, question uh, in, in the questions referred already this morning to the powerful technique of proving strong normalization via this method that carries, for example, easily to second order. Okay, we will, I will not treat second order here, but uh, it's once you see the technique, it's not very difficult to figure out how to do the second order. Okay, so... Before I start on linear logic, I should say that I have lecture zero, which is starting now, which is introducing some syntactical kit. So introducing some syntactical kit that will be used to build the actual syntax, so to construct the red question mark language here. So I want to introduce some of the kit that I need for that. And I'm going to start with zero and then carry on with one. Okay, and before I start, most of the work here is uh, the, the, the main worker 
on this area is uh, Guillaume uh, Munch, who is uh, here somewhere, and he, he will be there the, during the two weeks. So he's a good person to interact with, and you can interact with me until uh, Friday evening, because I'm, I'm, I'm going to be le uh, leaving on Saturday. And another key, another person involved in this collaboration is uh, Marcelo Fiore, with whom we are discussing something like here, trying also to see what are the relevant semantic structures at this red level. So what are the categorical counterparts, uh, what are the categorical ideas uh, that we would need to have a direct account of ideas that come from sequent calculus. And this is far from obvious. And I put double question mark because uh, this work is, is not yet uh, really in, in shape. Good. Okay, so um, I will make a, um, a, a huge collection of slides available and in my talk I will just pick a few of them. Okay, they, uh, I took the principle of adding and adding slides and uh, well, there, there are m the, the slides cover many more things than what I want to say, and they could be even confusing in the, in the fact that I'm mentioning many languages. So please free just to use the slides that correspond to the lectures. And if you want to know more, then, and, and you're not afraid of too many languages, or if you know some languages and want to see the relation, then, then refer to them. Okay. And I will actually spend probably more time on these two asides, which are quite interesting. So the, the second one, I already mentioned it, is to try to give you a good idea of why uh, this language, which by the way has a generic, generic name as the title in, in indicates, so we, we tentatively call this style of syntax, we call it system L in honor of Gensen because L is uh, the letter he uses for sequent calculus uh, as opposed to natural deduction system for which the letter N is used. And um, the point number A is I will try to, see, to show you that the rules for the different connectives, so you, you, we have seen already a few connectives, follow a quite general pattern that you can best understand with the notion of a general connective, which is quite related to the idea of synthetic connectives introduced by some work, in some work of Girard called Ludix. So I will try to say something about it at some point. Okay, so these are, this is a table in which I will only uh, touch at the three entries. So it's just to tell you um, that I will deal with the matrix with uh, a, a di of dimension three in some sense. So we already uh, know that I will speak about linear and classical logic. So these are two different things. And then for each of them, we will have to, well, in the case of classical logic, we will have to go to a more refined notion of proof, which I defer to define today because uh, I leave uh, to Frank the uh, privilege to, <laughs> to introduce the notion first tomorrow. Uh, so we will have systems that are focalized or non-focalized, and focalized for the moment means just a system with fewer proofs or mo and, and more constrained computation rules. Okay, and finally, there will be a distinction between systems in direct style and systems in indirect style. And here I'm referring to the terminology used in, uh, in the uh, so-called continuation passing style translations, where you say that the construct is direct style before you CPS translate it. And when you CPS translate it, then it's in indirect style. So we will see what 
this kind of distinction means in, in this setting. OK. So the, the three systems that we will have uh, to, w that we will go through. So today we will go through a syntax for linear logic. Tomorrow we will go through two syntaxes for classical logic, so LK. Um, both will be focalized. And for a good reason, because non-focalized systems are computationally, non-focalized classical systems are computationally trivial in the sense that you cannot endow a system of classical logic without, uh, with a reasonable operational semantics where you will not identify all proofs unless you do something. And this something is focalization. OK, so now. Let's start with lecture zero. So we have seen the cut rule this morning. Ah, no, before, before, before that, I need also to say some difference, because I'm going to be in two frameworks, the linear logic framework and the classical logic framework, where there is an intrinsic symmetry given by the fact that the negation in the logical system is going to be involutive. So we will have, both in linear logic and classical logic, the fact that A and not not A are the same or are isomorphic. But actually, they are going to be e exactly the same. So I will use this, this funny notation for negation. It's not so funny. You find it in... Uh, in uh, in books uh, on set theory, for example, uh, as the notation for the complement. So we will have this by definition for the good reason that the negation being involutive will be actually defined. It's, it's not going to be an explicit connective in the language. It's going to be defined by the laws of duality. So we will, we will, uh, we will see that in, in a minute. So that's a key difference uh, with the treatment of indistributionistic logic. Of course, when we will translate the intuitionistic uh, negation, we will not translate it by this simple-minded thing. We will we'll need to think a little bit more about it. So it's going to be quite different from this, but the framework that we introduced, that we shall introduce, will uh, allow us also to describe this, to decompose it in some sense, uh, using this involutive negation and using another operation that we will see and that is called the shift uh, connective. Okay, but this is a bit just an announcement. So that's one change with respect to the intuitionistic flow in, in, in the lectures of uh, Frank is that from the beginning I start with the idea that negation is involutive. And secondly, from the beginning I start with the idea that sequence are symmetric objects. So because you have a number of, some of assumptions, you also have a number of conclusions to have it symmetric. Okay? So we are not going to limit ourselves to a thing like this. Okay? And let me here make a comment and probably put a pointer here because I need to explain it at some point. So I need, uh, let, let me just give this as a pointer. At a certain point, I, 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 I will show you a two lines proof of the, the, of the excluded middle. And you will see why this very short proof relies on the fact that several formulas are allowed on the right of sequence. So it is very important that, in, that for intuitionistic systems, the fact that you have just one formula on the right is actually a very important property that uh, guarantees you to remain in the intuitionistic world. But I take the opposite view, and I'm happy with uh, 
a classical and fully symmetric view of things. Okay, so these, with these points now, I can start really uh, the lecture zero. So this was lecture minus one. And let's take the cut rule and let's try to see how we can transcribe the cut rule in terms of a syntax. So how can we make a term assignment system for this rule? So the first, so the f first note that the rule is, is a bit different in formulation than in Frank's lecture for two reasons. The first is that I'm allowing delta to be uh, the on the right to have uh, an arbitrary number of formulas, but also I also have distinct, as you see, distinct uh, assumptions and conclusions in the two sequence and I'm assembling them, okay? So this style, as we will see in a minute when we come to lecture one, is referred to as a multiplicative style, okay? While what uh, you saw in Frank's lecture is was in additive style. Okay, so with these two differences, you will recognize the cut rule, namely that you find uh, the formula A on the right in one of the assumptions and on the left on in the other assumption, and then you can sort of plug these two proofs together to eliminate this formula. But if you want now to transcribe this syntactically, you first have to notice that if I call delta 1 the, uh, the, 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 uh, <coughs> the sequence A delta prime 1, it might well be that A also occurs in delta prime 1. So I need to be very precise in seeing which, which of the possibly many assumptions A in the conclusion of the first hypothesis I really want to cut. The same thing on the right. So for this reason, our language is going to decompose this rule by some devices that take a sequence, gamma delta, so maybe I can write it here, So I have a sequence gam gamma, uh, let's call it like this, okay? And I want to say that the rule that I'm going to apply to this sequence is going to make this formula active. So the notion of active formula means that it's, it's the formula which uh, is important for this rule. So you see that A is the only named formula here in this rule. So we want to make this formula active and for this reason we will introduce explicitly different kinds of sequence. So we will have ordinary sequence and the syntax for them and we will have sequence where one formula has been is active and we will have explicit coercions between them so now let's look precisely what we do here at what we do here so when a sequence has no active formula uh, i'm just imitating what we do in natural deduction where all the assumptions are named by variables. So here we are going to name not only the assumptions but also the conclusions. So the assumptions are going to be named by variables x, y, which we will call variables, just like for lambda calculus. And for the conclusions, the, assumpt the, the, the assumptions, the, the formulas, will be named by letters alpha, beta, etc. For those of, of you who know about the lambda mu calculus, this, is, this notation is taken from there. And they will stand for what are called continuation variables. So now, suppose that I have a proof of 
this sequence. And I want to say that now A is active, then I will apply a binding construct to this proof called C, and I will call this binding construct mu. And this mu is exactly a variation of uh, Parigo's uh, mu in the lambda mu calculus, again for those of you who are familiar with that. And on the left, I'll do the same, except that I use a mu tilt. Okay. So the idea, just as in any binding construct, is that mu alpha dot c has the same free variable as c, except for alpha. And this corresponds exactly to the situation that now I'm speaking about the term of type A in this context. So I have excluded alpha from the context. I have abstracted it away from the context. So it's, it's really... Uh, where should I go? Okay. So... In order to account for the cut rule, so I need to activate this occurrence of A, named alpha, this occurrence of, 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 of this occurrence of A named X, and once this is done, I can say that I plug them together, and I have uh, I have uh, uh, this syntax for that, which uh, you can read as place this term V in context E. And maybe you can begin to understand why this language is going to be good for abstract machines. Because when, or even for operation semantics, when you do operation semantics, you explain how to evaluate an expression in context. Okay, and this, uh, stem, this, stem, this goes back to early works of Matthias Felizen on formalizing the operational semantics of the lambda calculus. So you can really think of this as being the context in which uh, uh, a, a given subterm is uh, evaluated. Okay, so let me summarize. So what we have is not exactly sequent calculus, it's a, it's, it's, it's a more detailed form of sequent calculus where we, in order to have a precise syntactic account, we have been led to introduce three kinds of judgments instead of just uh, the notion of sequence. So we have ordinary sequence which in the syntax will be denoted by a syntactic category called commands. And just for the reason I tried to explain here, because the, the typical term in this syntactic category is really like the state of an abstract machine. So, like a command. And then you will have terms of type A on the right, which look like the familiar lambda terms, or the familiar terms that we have seen in, in both Bob's and, uh, and uh, Franz's lecture. And symmetrically, we will have contexts which which you have to think, so you have to read this as E is a context who is expecting in its whole a value of type A. So the type of the context is not the type of the resulting term uh, obtained by filling the context, it's the type of the whole of the context. So that when I do the cut, I really have the same formula because I fill the whole of the context with a term of the same type. Okay, and in the next lecture tomorrow, in order to solve the uh, problems arising with uh, linear logic, we will need to have uh, focalized systems. And to account for this, we will also uh, use a fourth kind of judgment actually a fourth and a fifth, uh, we will consider among terms, some special terms which we'll call which we shall call values, and among contexts, we will uh, need special contexts which we shall call co-values. But this we'll see uh, more 
of it uh, tomorrow. Okay, so now, um, now I want to introduce another idea. So, and, uh, and another other pieces of syntax. So, so far what we have seen, let, let me summarize uh, what we have seen of our syntactic kit of system L. We don't have seen much, but still. We have seen C, and C is obtained by plugging a value into context E. And then we have seen an example of V, which is uh, mu alpha dot C. And uh, you may suspect that you also have variables. And for E, we already have seen mu tilde x, uh, sorry, yeah, mu tilde x dot C. And you suspect that symmetrically alpha is going to be a context. So now, I want to discuss a form of conjunction and a form of disjunction. So, and I want to, well, to preview, uh, but just briefly, the distinction that will um, be made clear by the lectures of tomorrow, uh, which is a distinction bet between reversible and irreversible rules for presenting connectives. So I want you to read the rules, the rule on the left, remove the term information, think of the tensor as a conjunction, and then I would like someone to tell me what is the difference between the rule which is here and the rule that we, you have seen in, in, uh, in Frank's lectures. So can anyone tell me what's the difference? This joint, well, yes, this joint context. The fact that contexts are being piled up rather than shared. Okay, so it's a difference. And now, think of this rule in terms of proof search. Is it the same? It, it d does the conclusion of this rule amount to the same thing as having the two assumptions of this rule? So I'm, 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 I'm telling so, uh, uh, something informal here. I, I, I will say that the rule is uh, reversible in case there is the same amount of information in the conclusion of the rule or in uh, putting together the assumptions. So, can anyone give me an argument why Frank's rule was reversible or irreversible and why this rule is, well, irreversible because it's already written? So, what makes it irreversible? So, this rule, mm -hmm. it seems like this rule is irreversible because you don't know which parts of the context go with which of the two contexts. That's right. So, if it doesn't prove the decision, you have to ac uh, allocate resources, and uh, to, so, 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 so you take a risk. While in, 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 the, in the formulation of Frank this morning, you just share the same context. So it's easy to see that uh, the rule is reversible, you have the same amount of information. So in other words, as far, if, if, if we take seriously the rule that we use to introduce the conjunction, Frank's conjunction of this morning is not the same as this conjunction. And by the way, I use a different symbol. Okay. So now, the rule on the right is even more different than, so think of this as a disjunction. So it's even more different to that of this morning. Okay. The Frank's rule of this morning was widely and m even more obviously irreversible because it was saying that from A you can deduce A or B. Okay, but this clearly 
uh, is not invertible. From A or B, you don't know A. But this rule is also perfectly understandable under, of course, I forgot to tell you, that the intuitive reading of a sequence gamma and tails delta, oh, sorry, I don't use Frank's notation for uh, sequence. I just use uh, the same turnstile. But since I'm mainly talking about sequence calculus, it's a homogeneous notation. So anyway, so the intuitive reading of this is that the conjunction of the formulas here entails the disjunctions of the formulas here. So with this understanding, it is clear that having the formula A1 or A2 or the sequence of formulas A1, A2 on the right of the sequence has exactly the same amount of information. Because the A1, A2 is just another way of speaking of A1 or A2. Well, this is also a perfectly sensible way to introduce the disjunction on the right. And it's the reversible one. And now I can complete the point I wanted to make here. Once we take this rule as primitive, then we have a very, very cheap proof of the um, excluded middle. Namely, if you want to prove A or not A, well, apply the rule for introducing the disjunction on the left, apply this rule, and then this is a version of the axiom. You will, uh, re you will recognize uh, A entails A. That's the axiom, but if you move this formula to the right, it becomes its negation, and then this is the axiom. Okay? And you see that you have this very cheap proof of the excluded middle <coughs> by accepting that you can have several formulas on the right of your sequence. So that, just to stress the point that one of the firewalls that the intuitionistic system uh, uh, put against this principle is by maintaining just one formula on the right of sequence. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, so the vertical bar is, is the usual. Ah. So a V is either this or this. Okay, and the mu alpha dot C is. Uh, this coercion that allows you to activate a formula. So you, 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 you start from a syntactic category and you end up in another one. Okay? We will see them in action. Okay. So now, let me take these two rules which I have justified, and um, I have giv given these names to the connectives, that these names come from linear logic. So this is a notion of disjunction, this is a notion of conjunction, and they uh, happen to be dual to each other in linear logic. And the dual of a reversible connective in linear logic is an irreversible connective. So now, for irreversible connectives, we make the choice that the syntax will use constructors. So from a term, in order to build a term of type A1 and A2 in the irreversible style, I will just assemble a pair of two terms of the respective types A1 and A2. For the reversible connective, I will use pattern matching binding constructs. So it's a slight 
variation on this same idea of a mu because what we shall do is we instead of think, taking two terms well here we just have one assumption in, 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 instead of taking one term we wouldn't even know which term of which type to take in this rule notice that A1 and A2 are relevant formulas to build A1 or A2 in this formulation of disjunction so you would come up if you had to sit down and try to think how to formulate this rule you would probably come up with the idea that the assumption should be a command because you wouldn't know exactly which on which which formula to activate because you need to activate both and then you form a term of type A1 or A2 so you add a case here to this syntactic category by a mu construct but which is now a structured mu construct it's not a mu alpha it's going to be okay sorry it should be an alpha 1 and an alpha 2 with my convention so you will construct mu alpha 1 alpha 2 dot c and that will be our syntax for building terms for uh, reversible connectives so why is this way of doing syntax sensible just because when we are going to cut a term t1 t2 against a term of dual type a1 or a2 computationally we will just have to pattern match t1 t2 against the pattern x1 x2 and then substitute t1 for x1 t2 for x2 so the cut elimination rule will be accounted by very simple programming language uh, IDs and principles okay so that's the choice that we try to uniformly adopt when you will see irreversible connectives we will use constructors when we you will see reversible connectives you will be you will see a mu uh, or a mu thing. okay yeah sure are you going to be introducing the mu to the context or should that be the mu to the oh okay so um, here you see that in these rules I have nothing on the left of the sequence so in, 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 in the rest of this lecture there will be n nothing like this syntactic category only, only terms V will be considered Uh, sorry. It's supposed to be a language expression, and then you also have these two extra things that you have on the board. Yes, exactly. Okay. So then you want to. These all fall into this category, but um, okay. because up to here I try to introduce my IDs with two-sided sequence which is probably the, the, the best way to understand uh, the things from the programming point of view but uh, for the sake of uh, economy of the number of rules and number of things uh, I will turn now to sequence that has this form and when you have an involutive negation you can do that easily because you can bring everything that was on the left you bring it on the right by taking its negation so that's why in the rest of the talk from now on you will not see this judgment context okay 
in your commands, you have okay. values on the yeah, left. Yeah, you're right. Values on the right. You're right. So, so then, sorry, it's something like this, okay? But actually, it's going to be something like this. So I'm not going to do uh, too much of polarities today because I, I, I want to defer this to, to tomorrow. But you see that I always assemble, in, in, it was clear in this discussion here, that this has as type an irreversible or positive formula. And this has as type an a reversible or negative formula. So my commands will always plug together a positive term with a negative term. Yeah, thank you for for the comment. Yes. Exactly. So yes. So in the in, in the bilateral form uh, formulation, you have that is very easy to follow while in the in the in the in the monolateral formulation it's a bit more difficult to follow you have to think that you cut a formula a against its negation so that's the formulation of the cut rule in the monosided version. Yes. Yes. So this this is coming. To finish uh, lecture zero. Yes. Um, by summarizing very briefly what are the features introduced so far. So we have introduced different kinds of judgments to account for the way to in which proofs are built in sequence calculus. And uh, so we needed to uh, have a notion of activation of formula. And I just want to comment here that we can, with the kit that we have introduced so far, we can also do the reverse coercion. So suppose that you are building a proof where you have introduced, for example, the last formula you have introduced is uh, this uh, A here, V of type A. But suppose that the, your next step is going to introduce a new formula uh, using now one of the formulas in delta. Why not? You, 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 you can build your proof by changing the formula you are working on. So for this, you will need to activate a formula in delta. But before you are allowed to do this, you need to deactivate the formula A. So what you need to do is to deactivate formula A and then activate the formula you want in delta. So how can you deactivate? Well, you can do this so again, sorry, I'm, I'm in the two-sided world. Uh, I'm using a special form of cut where I cut the term of type A <coughs> with the context obtained by applying the axiom. So V plugged in context alpha has the right type to be just a sequence. It's a command. So this is a little trick to uh, do the deactivation. And then you can build proofs by combining proofs that actually introduce connectives. And uh, you can activate and deactivate formulas according to your needs. Okay, and the second feature was this notion of structured pattern matching. OK, so now let's move to linear logic. So linear logic stands in, 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 in this slide. 
So let me just make a few remarks. First, the axiom rule has no context. So it just contains, so this is, you can read this as A entails A, just that it is now monosided, so I have taken the dual of A on the right. And uh, the contraction rule that was mentioned this morning and the weakening rule that was not so explicitly mentioned in the previous lectures, I think, are accounted explicitly and separately in linear logic. And they can only, so these are here, this is the weakening rule, and this is the contraction rule. And you see that in linear logic, weakening and contraction are not allowed on any formula. They are only allowed on formulas bearing an explicit modality, which uh, is called the why not. So the syntax of linear logic contains connectives for disjunction. So maybe we can come back to this just after. So here, the first line gives you the syntax for linear logic. So you will have two conjunctions and two disjunctions. I will come back to that. So that's the tensor and uh, the par are the two, no, sorry, the tensor and the width are the two conjunctions. So that's, the width is uh, the ampersand symbol, uh, the just and, and the two disjunctions are the plus and the par, and the par is uh, this uh, symbol which is the uh, fourth in the sequence. A, it's the ampersand that is written. And we have in linear logic a connective, which is called of course, and it's dual, which is called uh, the why not. And they are there to control the use of weakening and contraction. So then the next observation is to see that if I had an unconstrained contraction and an unconstrained weakening rule, then the two rules that are given here for, for introducing a conjunction, the one for the tensor on one hand and the one for the width on the other hand, would be intertranslatable. So it's exercise to show that in presence of unlimited weakening, so forget about these funny signs, if you accept uh, a gamma here, if you accept from a, a gamma to a gamma, then from assuming just one form of conjunction, you can derive the other one using some contraction and some weakening. But of course, as soon as you constrain contraction and weakening to occur only on certain formula, they are not equivalent anymore. So that's why they were introduced as different connectives in linear logic. Now, we will see tomorrow that there are also good reasons for keeping them distinct, even in the presence of unlimited weakening and contraction, because they have different computational behaviors. And as such, they could also be considered distinct. But from the history point of view, uh, the notation and the ID comes from linear logic. Okay, so I think we know by now all these rules because we have seen either in the slide here, in a slide here, or in, in Frank's lecture. So this morning, what we have seen was a plus and a with. So in terms of linear logic, what we have seen this morning are additive connectives. I will, I will uh, present this terminology in the next slide. And 
So we have seen in Frank's lecture the plus and the with. And we have seen in the slide just before this new form of disjunction called the par and this new form of conjunction called the tensor. And these two connectives are called the multiplicatives in English. And we have seen the cut rule, we have seen the axiom, and now we need to comment on these two rules here, which are, because we have now a new connective, which is this modality called the bound or the why not, I also need to introduce this, uh, this connective uh, if I want to follow the, the general scheme of sequence calculus. So, the idea of this connective is to think in terms of resources. If I tell you bang A, it means that I have an unlimited amount of A. So I think now of A not as a formula but as a resource. Like for example, a one dollar bill. So having a bang A in my pocket means that actually if, you, if I want an item that, uh, that is worth uh, one thousand dollars, with my bang A, I have no problem, I can buy it. Okay. And if you think of the why not A, it's a more dangerous thing. So A is again one dollar. Now why not A is some dollars, but I don't know exactly how many. It could be zero, one, two, three, or one thousand, or I don't know many millions, billions, but I don't know. So now, if you have this in mind, this is quite easy to read. The first rule, just, uh, just put this on the right, the, uh, the question mark gamma. So on the right, because the dual of question mark is uh, bang, it means that if I have an unlimited amount of the dual of gamma, I have A. But since my amount of assumptions is illimited, I can repeat it. So I can get also an unlimited amount of my conclusion. That's the reading of this one. And the reading of this one is that just what I told you, the dangerous thing. So I can take a risk. I have one dollar in my pocket and I decide to turn it into N dollar. So it's like going to a casino. I can, uh, well, no, in, a, in the casino it's worse because you can really lose money. Here, here you, you just, you just cancels your money. You cannot go negative, but, but you can get zero or, or an enormous amount. Okay, and so in terms of reversible and irreversible rules, this sounds very much reversible or irreversible, this one. Reversible, and this one, irreversible. So again, you see that the dual connectives have uh, this duality between reversible and irreversible. Okay, so now let's summarize. So, I've been using a lot this notation of uh, uh, the Morgan dual, or the negation as a defined connective. So let me be uh, now precise. So, the involutive negation is uh, present in the syntax on atoms only. Because for the rest it is defined. So the dual of the tensor is the power of the dual. The dual of the plus is the width of, uh, I don't know, there is a funny symbol there, probably a misprint. So the, the dual of the plus is, uh, is the width of the dual. The dual of the bound is the uh, why not of the dual. And uh, conversely, I mean, the dual of the par is the tensor of the duals, uh, 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 etc. Okay, so now let me gi give a word of terminology, only a word, about uh, uh, the terminology used by Girard in, in, in his uh, founding paper in linear logic. So he divided the connectives of linear logic in three groups and call them respectively multiplicatives, additives, and exponentials. And I 
can give you a very quick explanation and a very good exercise to, uh, to practice on the rules of linear logic. So the explanation for this terminology comes from the models of linear logic. So I'm touching here on the right side of Bob's picture, trying to give a very, very quick introduction to the idea of um, a very simple and even, even a bit too degenerate model of linear logic called the relational model of linear logic. So it's like denotational semantics. I want to give a meaning to formulas and I want also to give a meaning to proofs and uh, that's what I'm going to do. So formulas are going to be interpreted as sets but you have not to think about the elements of this set as being the meaning of the proofs. The elements of this set are rather to be thought as tokens, information tokens that you put together in order to obtain a real data. Okay. So that's why formulas are interpreted as sets and proofs are interpreted as subsets of the corresponding types. So um, the model is degenerate in the sense that um, it interprets dual formulas in the, in the same way. So it, it, it cannot see the duality. So the tensor and the par are both interpreted as the Cartesian product of the two interpretations. The plus and the width are interpreted as the disjoint union of the two sets. And the bang A and the why not A are is interpreted by the set of all finite multisets of elements of A. Okay? So this should explain very clearly, except for the last line, the terminology used. Because everyone knows the cardinal of a Cartesian product is the product of the cardinals. So it's a multiplication, while the cardinal of a distant union is the addition of the cardinals, so it's an additive thing. Now, for the third line, for the fourth line, and well, yeah, I, I forgot to, uh, to, to tell that for atoms you have to make decisions. It's, it's <coughs> uh, like everywhere in logic, when you begin to interpret a syntax that has variables, you have to make choices. Okay, um, so the fourth line, if, if you follow me, isn't quite exponential in the sense that if A is a, has finite cardinal N, M fin of uh, A is going just to be an infinite set. Because if you take the finite multi sets of elements of a set, then you can take A, 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 A as many times as you want, so you have an infinite set. So it's not quite exponential. But it happens that there is a variation of this. So the, the first model of linear logic was not as degenerate as this. It uh, had a way to distinguish duals, but for this you need to introduce some relation between your tokens. You must say when your tokens are compatible or not compatible, and then if you have this notion, you have enough information to uh, make different interpretations of your connectives. And then with this, so this is called coherent spaces. And with this interpretation, then you have another way to interpret the bang, which is a little bit less invasive in terms of uh, explosion of numbers of tokens. You just take here the finite subsets of A. And then you see the reason for exponential, because uh, this is precisely the relation in cardinality between a set and the power set of this set. But for reasons that are known to the logic community, the to linear logic community, uh, taking the finite subsets just in the relational setting doesn't work. So you need to have the Korean spaces to make it work. Okay, so the exercise 
is that you take all, there are not so many of them, take all the proof rules and try to execute this program. Give explicitly the interpretation of uh, the proof of the conclusion, knowing the interpretation of the proof of the assumption. And then you will understand why uh, the multiplicatives are really interpreted as, as Cartesian product and uh, the, uh, the additives as disjoint unions. Okay, so I have about a uh, quarter of an hour. Okay, so now, in the last quarter of an hour, I will complete the description of this syntax, which I already sketched, to cover all the cases of linear logic. So what I'm going to do is to turn this proof system, which has no decoration by terms, and to give you term decoration for all of them. And this is given here. So so in this monolateral presentation, I use I don't use uh, x and alpha for variables. I just use x, even if it's on the right. So. The axiom tells me that if among uh, my assumptions I have, uh, no, tells me that, uh, well, it's, it's the axiom, but uh, it tells me that X is well typed of type A uh, in uh, context X of type dual of A. Now, the second rule is, was not present in this because here we only had one kind of sequence, but we have seen that in order to give a syntactic account, we want to have different kinds of sequence. So that's why we have now the mu construct that allows me to uh, coerce commands into a sequence where one formula is active. Now here, you recognize the cut rule that has already been discussed. You recognize the formation of the tensor that we already discussed. Uh, now, you recognize uh, Frank's introduction for the disjunction. And quite naturally, I will use... So, since Frank's disjunction was irreversible, I use constructors and I use quite naturally the in-left construct, thinking of uh, A1 plus A2 as uh, the disjoint union of A1 and, and A2. Okay, same thing for in-right. Then we have already seen uh, the, the power. And so this is the rule for the with. So this is a bit more complex because you could think, well, it's a width, so I could make the pair of two things. Okay, but I prefer to reserve the notion of pair for the tensor that was line above. So here I follow the scheme. Because the width is a reversible connective, I apply the general method, uh, in the, the general philosophy in the syntax, to say, well, I need a m pattern matching construct for that. So, uh, or, a, or a case construct. So, that's uh, the syntactic account of it. So, I have a command of, uh, for proving A1 gamma. I have an other command for proving A2 gamma. And I assemble them in this way to form a command of type A1 with A2. And in order to convince you that this is sensible, let me give you immediately the computation rule corresponding to it. So you see that I need to match 
somebody of type with, with, a, with somebody of its dual type, which is plus. So I'm going to plug it either with an in left of T1 or an in right of T2. So this is accounted by the fourth line in this slide. If I plug in, life, in left of T1 with this new construct, I choose the left branch of the mu construct, throw the C2 away, and substitute T1 for X1 in C1. So again, you see this, uh, this pattern matching in, 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 in action. Okay? So for the last rules, I will not insist too much because uh, we will not deal too long with linear logic, but I just, so I do it a bit more briefly. I told you that uh, the introduction for Bang was uh, irreversible. So again, sorry, it was reversible. So again, we use a binding construct for that. And for introducing the why not, I said it was irreversible, so we use a constructor. And again, if we match a guy of this type with a guy of this type, what we will do is again the same style of reduction. So this is the line in red. We just remove the bound decoration, substitute T for X. So you see an, a uniform scheme in all these rules. And we will see tomorrow at some point in the lecture the notion of general connective, where this ID will, will pop up very clearly. So there, there, there is a, a generalization that has as instances all of these lines. And finally, for the time being, just for the sake of uh, the last uh, five minutes or so, I will use explicit notation for the weakening rule and the contraction rule. So I just mark explicitly that I have applied a weakening and I just mark explicitly that I have applied a contraction. Okay, so now in the five last minutes, I want to discuss something that has not been discussed so far, which is we have seen some notion of reduction in the, in the lectures of, uh, of, um, of Frank. But we have not yet seen a, discuss a discussion of confluence. That means, do all the computation paths lead uh, to uh, the same result? So, an important feature that we are seeking, both for linear logic, for intuitionistic logic, and for the version of classical logic that we will see tomorrow, we all, in all these situations, we seek for confluence. So let's see how, why we can be confident that the reduction system that I just gave here is morally confluent. And I will tell you what morally means. So, as you probably know, I, I guess that everybody of you has had some kind of introduction to the basics of rewriting systems, you already probably all know that in order to check that the system is confluent, you have to look for so-called critical pairs. So that are terms to which you can apply two rules and follow two different computation paths, which you have to complete to get a unique uh, common reduct for these terms. So the critical pair in these systems are listed here, but I will only analyze the first one. So you see that, oh, I didn't comment on the first two rules, sorry. I commented on all the rules except the first two. So I introduced this mu and this, uh, uh, yes, the mu construct. So the mu construct has this behavior. It's, 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 it's just, if you are used to beta reduction, it's very similar to beta reduction, except that the mu doesn't have to do anything with implication. The mu can be of any type. Okay. So it's, it's the only difference, but otherwise it's, it's, it's really like a beta reduction. So you see that if you have a term of 
this form mu x against another mu x, mu x1 against another mu x2, you can choose to apply the red rule, the rule that will substitute uh, the right hand side for x1 minus or the contrary. So you can read the slide in more detail because I'm, I'm not going to comment it in too much uh, degree of detail. But by analyzing, because the syntax so far, as I have introduced it uh, here in this slide, because the syntax is linear, what does it mean that the syntax is linear? It means that in every term, when I see a variable, uh, sorry, yes, when, um, yes, no, in, in, in a term, uh, a variable occurs exactly, uh, in, in a free position, ex occurs exactly once. That's, that's what a linear syntax is. And uh, the fact that the syntax is uh, kept linear has to do with the fact that I have these explicit uh, notations for the contraction and the weakening. So because of the linearity, it's not difficult to see that this x1 minus occurs, as I just said, occurs exactly one in, once in C1. So C1 must have the form, it's a big term, and a hole in this term has the form x1 minus cut with something. If you remember, this was the syntax for deactivation. So, the same thing for C2. So now, if I apply first the mu x1 minus rule, then I substitute for x1 minus the uh, term on the right, okay, and after a second step, what I end up with is with this term called C1, C2, T1 plus T2 minus. So the important information is that I'm piling up the context capital C1 and capital C2 in this order. While if I had chosen symmetrically to reduce the mu x2 plus first, then I would have filed the context in the reverse order. Okay? But now we have a very simple geometric picture to contemplate. Namely, either do this and then that or either do that and then this. Okay, it should be blue. It should be blue. And it's not difficult to figure out that you can pay this if you have enough rules of commutations. So the idea is that you have introduced connectives in some order here and in some other order here. But you can change this order if you give yourself, and it, 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 it needs a little bit of patience, and uh, this should be written in some detail somewhere, but uh, has not been done fully as far as I know. But I just want to give you the idea. So if you accept these elementary commutations as being modulo rules, that means that you reason modulo these commutations, then you get confluence. So that's why I said the system is morally confluent. So now my last observation is what would happen if I had not a linear syntax? In particular, what would happen 
if I had unlimited contraction and weakening, then this argument would not work anymore. And we will see tomorrow that instead we face a wild non-confluence problem. So on one hand, we have a confluence system given by linear logic using the following restriction, which is a restriction by types in some sense, which tells me that contraction and weakening can be applied only to certain formulas. That's one way to solve the difficulty that we will see tomorrow with classical logic. The other way will be not to restrict the classical logic, not to give any kind of restriction on the rules of classical logic, but instead to give restrictions on the computation rules of classical logic. And that's the route followed by uh, focalization. And that will be the subject of tomorrow's lecture. Okay, thank you. Questions? Um, it's just when you write uh, any of the rules that you have seen in the lectures uh, the day before yesterday, yesterday you always hit, uh, have seen uh, things like gamma whose gamma, which is always a context, and then there is one formula. Okay. That's the formula which uh, is uh, introduced by the rule. Okay. So typically, I don't know, let's go back to well, any of these rules. So let's pick one of the one for tensor. I don't care what is in gamma, I don't care what is in delta, I just put them together. Why? A1 and A2 are active formulas because I'm building something up. So the, it's better to think of the other formulas as not being active. Uh, so these are uh, put in as administrative reductions in your, your calculus? To, to just go through your context to, to see what you, you want to do? Or what? Do you mean the formula in gamma delta? Well, Yeah, they, they, they are the three variables.
and it, it, it replaces a variable in the context. If you want to replace a variable, you need something of a given type. So you need to have activated this type. That's the idea. Does it make sense to me? Uh, a command is, has no type, except that it's, it's in, a, in, the dark, in, the, in the context. Uh, gamma and delta, but it has no type. Right. So why not use these substitutions in the rules themselves? Hmm? Why not use these substitutions in the rules themselves? Ah. Okay, that's a good point. So this system here can be read in two manners. It can be read in the style of explicit substitution, where this substitution should be actually carried out, and this would require some work. Or it can be read in the style of the lambda calculus, classical lambda calculus, just do it in, in one way. So if you do in, as in the lambda calculus, then you have a more comfortable life. Because then you can prove theorems just as you prove them for the lambda calculus, and you will do, do that in the lecture three. No? But if we want to account completely for the cut elimination as the, as the, as um, uh, Frank began to do this morning, then we would need to have an explicit version, and we would see that well, in in, in the cut elimination process. You have two kinds of specific elimination steps. The nice ones and the administrative ones. We use some, some of the words. So the nice ones correspond to all the rules I have given here. And this corresponds to two uh, formulas that have been activated just right before the class. Or introduced just right before the class. If it's not the case, then I have to commute rules. So in, in uh, the terminology of Genson, these are called the commutative cut elimination rules. And this would be accounted in this setting by actually pushing the substitution through uh, the structure of the command. So maybe we should uh, stop here. Thank you.